First of all, I'd just like to, for you to talk about your first meeting with Brian. The cogs have to go back about 30 years, I think. Um, I can't, can't remember if I actually met Brian in an re orchestral rehearsal or um, if it was something related to the quartet. Um, I used to play in the London Symphony Orchestra and they scheduled a performance of his orchestral piece, La Terre et un Homme, during the time that I was there, the short time I was there. Um, and we were involved in rehearsing it with Claudio Abado conducting the piece, an extremely complex piece or so I thought at the time. Um, and he, all, the, all the string parts were individual parts. Of course, rehearsing the piece, I was aware that they weren't being played very accurately. So this, in a way, frustrated me. I was sitting at the front of the orchestra. I was co-leading the orchestra on the occasion of that concert. Um, and the people around me were making an effort to play, but not really playing it very well. The people at the back of the section were nowhere near the, the correct notes and rhythms. And so there was a little bit of frustration. I, of course, knew who Brian was. And I think, I can't remember whether there was also some um, discussion about us playing the second quartet at that point, or whether that, that came slightly before this occasion or slightly afterwards. Um, but I remember taking Brian aside during one of the breaks of the rehearsal and saying, why do you write such complex music um, for an orchestra? I can understand if it was a solo piece or a ch chamber music piece, but why do you do it for, for an orchestra? I said, this is a good orchestra compared to, to, to most, and they're not playing it accurately. He didn't deliberate for very long. He just basically said that he had to write what he had to write, and he couldn't take into account the limitations of orchestral players at that time. Um, I found this a little strange, but it was perhaps the beginning of an understanding of, of what Brian Fernihel was all about and what his music was all about. And certainly this concept of, of writing something that maybe was too complex or unattainable um, is something that, of course, one becomes totally aware of when you're, um, when you're looking, when you're rehearsing or um, putting together his solo pieces and chamber music, trio, string quartets. You mentioned there that um, about um, playing the second string quartet around that time. How did that come about, the second quartet? Well, it was quite a funny occasion, actually, because it was in 1980. It was the same period. Um, the RDT quartet had been going for six years, but um, not really vigorously. I think what was interesting, and perhaps one of the reasons for our success, was that it was a hobby. Contemporary music was my hobby. It was something I did not only as a student, but as a schoolboy. Um, going to Darmstadt when I was 15 and, and listening to the music of Stockhausen, Ligeti, Sanakis. It, it was a real pleasure and something that I got into. Um, and alongside learning the violin at the Royal Academy of Music, where, where I attended for five years from the age of 16, um, my, my interest was in contemporary music, but there was not so much um, tuition for contemporary music, so I learned how to play the violin, of course, um, learning classical music. My hobby was to play contemporary music, and the Arditi Quartet started really as a hobby. Its players at the time, myself included, all had other jobs. I was playing with orchestras and then for three or four years I had a job with the London Symphony Orchestra. Um, so it was something we enjoyed doing. We came together to play together and we rehearsed as much as it was necessary to to prepare music. Not We didn't really have too much restriction on, on time in those days. Um, and we weren't reliant on it for our income, which I think is the most relevant factor. We met composers and they enjoyed working with us and consequently, word got around that the Arditi Quartet was a really serious group and enjoyed playing contemporary music, which was slightly unusual at that time. 
Um, we first, I think, worked with Ligeti and then with Hansa and were involved with important concerts in London and elsewhere of their quartets and very soon on recordings for Vergo of their complete string quartets. Um, all this happened before I met Brian. It was in the latter part of the second half of the 70s. Um, and I think Brian had heard of us or whoever was promoting him at the time had suggested um, that that we would be a good choice for performing the second string quartet which was actually written to be played by another quartet and they had I think a series of problems change of players and felt they couldn't do the piece so the piece was written and not performed so we came in to rescue it really um, and I was not familiar with Brian's music but we took it on um, and and did it and really enjoyed doing it I think um, Working with Brian was fascinating. He was, it was another world of music which I hadn't been familiar with, and we were keen to continue this relationship. Um, then over the years, I suppose, in a way, he was one of the most interesting composers that we've encouraged. It's, it's always a two-way thing. I mean, composers write pieces, um, we play them, and they enjoy writing for the group. They enjoy what they get. Um, back from the group, the sort of rehearsing and performances that that is what they want and that is stimulating to them. And, and so it's an ongoing process and we just like working with Brian. I think probably most continuously he's the composer who's written most music for us, although there are others who've written many quartets. But over the years he's someone that we've constantly wanted music from because of the great depth of the music and the great interest in rehearsal. Obviously, we're talking about very complex music and the sort of um, intellectual challenge, intellectual and performing challenge that is required to, to prepare pieces like that is something that, that I personally, I know, or, or other members of the quartet and over the years have found very stimulating. With the Sixth Quartet in particular, what was the, the, the circumstances to the commissioning of that? Yes, well, I suppose the between second, third and fourth and fifth quartets, quite a long period of time elapsed. Um, I quite like this in a way, not to have pieces too soon from composers because one one feels the composer has a time to develop and, and think about new ideas for a piece. Although it's not to say that people who write pieces very quickly can't write very interesting pieces. But I think sometimes if a lot of energy has gone into the composition of a piece, the composer needs a bit of time to rest and go off and do other things um, and then come back. So we've had this, these periods of time. I know Brian complained a little. He often complains that we ask for too much. Um, but I just like working with him. I like working with his music. As I said, it's altogether very stimulating um, to be part of, of, of realizing a new piece by him and having a piece in our repertoire that we can play frequently. Um, there were four pieces quite recently in the last three years, the fit following the fifth quartet, there was um, a piece called Dom Transisets, which he wrote, a shortish piece, but it's, it's still quite substantial at 13 minutes. And then we asked him for a piece for Elliot Carter's 100th birthday, which for a concert in Paris, we wanted, they wanted to have Carter write a new piece. And I asked Elliot to, if he would do such a thing. And he said to me, I think I'd finish with writing string quartets. Five string quartets is enough. Um, and so I then had the idea to ask other composers to write pieces that would be performed in the same concert as some Carter string quartets. Um, and Brian was an obvious choice, although very different to Carter. They they relate in many ways. If If you look at contemporary composers today, they have quite a few connections. 
Um, and Brian wrote his piece Exordium, which is the shortest of the four pieces. He wrote it for that occasion. And then um, Armin Kula from, um, from the Donaueschingen Festival came and said that he would like to feature string quartets in the 2010 festival. Um, and he was thinking of inviting three performing string quartets and um, all to play new repertoire and what were the suggestions for it. In, in fact, he asked me to curate a little bit the, the whole concept of the quartet in Donna Eschingen, um, which I was very happy to do because Donna Eschingen is not a festival normally um, associated with string quartets. It's an orchestral festival. They have the SWR orchestra there and the possibility to work with them for two concerts, always over a weekend. So we have been once before in 99, but it was quite nice that he was actually um, featuring string quartets in the festival, having three groups play. Um, again, Brian was the obvious choice to write what I consider a deep and meaningful work for this occasion. And Brian accepted immediately. So the, the period of of refreshment in between quartets was telescope this time um, and Brian came up with this amazing sixth quartet this very dense piece very melodic piece it's it, it's a new world it's a continuation it's probably not a new world but one can see the development through Brian's string quartet music um, from the early days and it was kind of interesting for us to to come in on it with the second quartet, which is also highly developed in comparison to the early sonatas, which we went back to after having done the second quartet. I like going back to things. People, when we first started, people said of our Webern performances, it's, it's quite different to classical quartets, but then the Arditi Quartet is going back to Webern from contemporary music, and most people most um, most uh, classical quartets come from late Beethoven and Schubert towards the second Viennese school. So this looking back is a nice feeling. I think it we offer a different perspective on, on interpretation to other groups. I've always felt that, uh, and with more classical music also. You mentioned specifically the sixth quartet relating to the second. It relates more to the second than it does to the first. Yes. But in fact, there I think I see the first as something quite different. And then the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth as some sort of progression mm. that one could map. But you mentioned the lyrical quality of the sixth, though. Is that something that you that you immediately struck you about it? Yes, I think it is a lyrical piece. The fact that it has these solos, lots of solos for instruments and... Maybe I'm thinking more melodically the whole concept of sound, the, the whole concept of what sort of vibrato to use for Brian's music. I remember discussions in the past with him about um, how to play the music. I'm very involved with the sort of sound we give to each different composer. I mean, some composers need a, a lush and classical vibrato that, that classical players give classical music and there are all sorts of refinements to the way one um, reacts with the left hand to, to the music of today and I find that it's very interesting to have like a certain image of each composer and the way they'd like to hear their music the way they'd like to hear it because we prepare um, pieces with composers wherever possible so that the interpretation is something that involves both us and the composer. And often composers don't think about this, um, but for me it's very important to define the style of interpretation, how the quartet or myself, if it's a solo piece, how it's going to sound. And to come back to Brian, he mentioned to me some time ago that he doesn't ex want us to exclude vibrato in the performance of his music. He's very clear about that. Um, I think we had discussions about Intermedio, which is the first solo piece he wrote. Um, the piece begins 
non vibrato for one one line or system and then it says poco vibrato and then the third line or, or at some point very near the beginning it says vibrato um, and we've I had been used to playing a lot of music without vibrato this comment by him stuck in my mind particularly not to exclude vibrato of course most of the, that piece is it contains very fast music um, so it's very difficult to do vibrato but I think what Brian meant was the whole concept of sound he wanted a classical sound to, for, his, for his string music to be perceived if he intended so or if he didn't he would actually notate it about the preparations for the sixth quartet itself how did you plan the rehearsal schedule it's always quite complicated to plan rehearsal schedules in advance because you never know when a composer is going to finish his piece. That's one of the biggest headaches of specialising in new music. Um, Brian has been notoriously late in many of his pieces, not only string quartets. Many premieres have been cancelled. Um, but we never cancelled any of the quartets, although some of the material arrived at the very last minute. I remember the the viola solo at the end of the third quartet was written by hand in Paris. Um, that's where the premiere was, and it wasn't completed two or three days before the, the performance. Um, the intermedia, the piece I was just talking about, the solo violin piece, the last two pages of the score were handed to me in Donnerschingen, um, where the premiere was given two days later. It was handed to me in the, in the morning of the day before the concert. Brian had stayed up all night to complete the piece. And that same evening I had to record it in the studio the day before the concert. So we've had these situations with Brian and also other composers. Um, I can somehow sympathise with this because I've never understood the the ability of composers to produce. For me, music is something that comes or doesn't come. And it's not, um, it, it, I find it incredible that composers can just write and, and, and have things ready, that, that they can be stimulated just by the concept of a commission and, and sitting somewhere and be, be aware of, you know, the, the time, the time problem of having to finish pieces by certain, by certain specific dates. So composers are often giving us this problem and so it's very difficult to plan rehearsals we we planned rehearsals as late as possible with the sixth quartet assuming that we get the score at the last minute um, Brian told me that he wanted to write a substantial piece he's been saying now for some years that he wanted to write a piece to balance out sonatas sonatas being the longest quartet of 35 37 minutes um, he said this with the fifth quartet and it ended up being shorter, less than 20 minutes, because of time constrictions, I suppose. Um, what's interesting with Brian is that he starts writing new, a piece with an idea, and then he can go off in another direction and turn it into something else. I find that also very stimulating, that he's not conditioned by the original concept of the piece. Uh, and how the piece progresses often determines where he goes and how he writes the piece. I remember when we were giving, just before giving the premiere of the third quartet, he came to London to rehearse in my house and he'd only written the first movement and was beginning the second movement and he was supposed to be rehearsing the whole piece with us. In fact, he hardly attended any rehearsals and spent the time in the top room um, or the bottom room, writing the second movement while we were rehearsing on our own, the first movement. Um, and he'd left some plans or note plans in, I don't even remember where he was at that time, whether it was still in Freiburg or San Diego, but he'd left this material behind, I think it was in America. And um, he said, oh, oh, I can't get, can't we, I can't get it, um, there's no one at home, can't be sent or I think faxed in those days. Um, he said, I'll just write different notes. 
I'll write a different piece. I'll continue in a different way. And so for me, this is, was fascinating to be so adaptable, to be able to do something like that in the middle of a piece. Um, Brian did not let us down with the Sixth Quartet, and in fact, it was finished before the summer. It was the beginning of the autumn before we got proper material, or late August. But um, I think he completed the piece in June or July, which was very nice for us because it gave us quite a lot of time to look at the music, which is something that we need to do before um, beginning rehearsing. With a piece like, with a score of Brian's, there's an awful lot of work that goes in to the preparation before the four of us come together. Um, of course, you filmed the the beginnings of us coming together and discussing how we're going to um, analyze the piece and perform it. But there's also the looking at the notes, which which occurs m before that process begins. And so we had a lot of time to look at it in the score and see what sort of piece it was and see what challenges we had to solve. So after the initial process of individually looking at the parts, we, we come together, we analyze the score, we maybe made mathematical calculations to simplify the understanding of the music for us, change bar lengths, change tempi, in order that um, we can more clearly access what Brian wants. When I say change, change tempi because of his layers of irrationals, which actually mean differences in temp tempo. Um, sometimes it's easier to to rewrite some bars with a different tempo and remove one layer of irrationals. Um, because to perceive a different tempo um, is simpler with them, a single layer of irrationals on top of that rather than a double layer. Um, I've had discussions with Brian about this in the past he feels he has to write the music the way he writes it, that's the way he sees it. But as a performer, to really understand more clearly um, how the piece should be played, we need to do this homework, this mathematical homework, before we begin rehearsing. Then, um, I think you filmed that, you filmed the first time we put bow to string on the piece, rehearsing the first um, 50 or 60 bars. And then we had some rehearsals, which you didn't film, rehearsals of the piece, um, preparing the whole piece, because in your filming we only prepared or rehearsed the first, the first section of the piece. And then you picked us up again in Freiburg when we'd gone through the whole piece and where we had Brian um, to begin rehearsing with him. So with a work like uh, of this sort of complexity, like the Sixth Quartet, do you plan how many rehearsals you, you require for it? Yes, I think we do. We estimate and, and we have to make it work or rob from somewhere else or extend rehearsal times. So what was this coming out about? Six rehearsals, seven rehearsals? Because we filmed four. Something like that. Yeah, it depends how you judge rehearsals. I mean, a day is or or slots of three or four hours or whatever they are. I was, I was, I was doing three hour sessions. When... It's much quicker these days than it used to be. I think, I think it was something like 65 hours we spent rehearsing the second quartet in 1980. Of course, we were less good at it then, um, but that's a piece of about nine or 10 minutes. Don't remember it precisely. 65 hours is quite a few more rehearsals. Um, but one of my famous statements in those days was when someone asked me how we were, man how we were able to manage the impossible. I just said, well, nothing's impossible if you spend enough time sorting it out. Um, I think to a large degree that's true. Um, because if you really sort something out, then you know how to do it. Could you talk a little bit more about what you did with the Sixth Quartet when you first got the score? Yes, I, I think we all, we all had the score. We all had the score from the very beginning, and the idea was that everyone would go away and do their homework and 
decide how we would decipher the piece. It's very important for us to make these tempi changes to understand and access the music quicker. Um, and I think on this occasion, everyone really contributed. Everyone had the score and everyone thought about it. And we had a real quartet discussion. In the old days, I used to do most of the work. Um, most of the process work before we begin rehearsing and I just used to tell the other players um, how we were going to decipher the piece but I think this kitchen table as it became known um, this kitchen table pre-rehearsal um, analysis of the piece became um, quite important for a lot of composers um, that we, we had to deal with in that way and I think with, with the Sixth Quartet, we all did the work. And then the, the eventual um, decisions were, was a process of elimination. We all came together and decided um, which would be jointly, which would be the best solution to take for each occasion. Um, because sometimes you can't go the, with Brian's music. All the, all the four players are doing different things often. And so if, if somebody is doing something together, you have to use that as the unit base. And then the other people um, around it doing different things, often the, the new barring doesn't work so well for them. So you have to go with the ensemble concept um, of, of, of this analysis so that things must be together if they're supposed to be together. So you, that this is the main criteria for changing the things and understanding, um, understanding the rhythms of the piece. So when you're doing your own homework, um, is this, uh, some of this will be away from the instrument, some of them will, will be with the instrument? No, none of it's with the instrument. Right. Um, it's not preparing the piece in that way. It's, it's preparing the piece to be played, um, not, not, from a point of view of of actually playing the music, but actually sorting out the rhythms and how they're going to be played. Do you ever translate the rhythms themselves into graph paper to work them out on some sort of grid? Sometimes drawing lines through the score, not onto graph paper, no. Um, but sometimes drawing lines through. It depends on how the, how the material is presented. Um, Brian works with Finale and We've had many discussions recently with his publishers um, who have had the parts copied and the, the the format is not the same, the spacing is not the same and the spacing is very important in Brian's music because sometimes if the irrationals are very complicated to understand you rely on the spacing to know how to play, at least within the bar. So you want to see proportional spacing then? Yeah, it's very important to see proportional spacing within each bar. You can't obviously do it throughout the piece um, because then when we have long notes you'd have huge huge wasted spaces but at least within the bar it's important to know where things fall mm. visually how do you see Brian's music from a technical point of view is it expanding the, the violin techniques beyond the repertoire that you were used to before I think it always did. I'm not sure it's doing anything new in that respect, although he does have more challenging things as, as his music progresses. Um, the second quartet was very challenging. What, what's very interesting for me is in such complex music, Brian understands very well how to write for the instruments. I don't think I've ever come across something that can't be played. Um, and I think this is extraordinary for a non-string player and for someone writing such complex material. He really has a good feeling for how to write for instruments. And although it's challenging, extremely difficult, it's never impossible. So how do you feel that fits with um, other types of virtuosic music, especially sort of 19th century virtuosic music, which is the standard part of the violin repertory? Right. Well, it relates to it, but I can't have a direct comparison because I don't play that. <laughs> <laughs> It's challenging, yes. It's virtuoso music. It, it's like Paganini or Vinyavsky or whatever, but much more interesting. Yes. Um, for me, the concept of that sort of music is, is it's technically challenging only, and the music is much more superficial. So it's very interesting to have, to have a Fernie Howe who is writing real music, but also 
providing this tremendous challenge. I mean, I think it's the challenge of the composers, composers like Brian, that, that, that have kept me stimulated for the last 36 years. I never get bored. People say, aren't you fed up? You've been traveling around the world. You've been playing this sort of music now all your life. And you're fed up. And I say, no, because it's always constantly challenging. And why is that? It's because perhaps the, the level of accuracy you can achieve is slightly less than in other, other music, more simple music. Not, not simple music, but other music. So um, the concept of performance, of interpretation, of realization of what you see in front of you can always be improved can always be changed. So there's always something constantly to work towards. And uh, this is something very refreshing about contemporary music, not just Brian, but contemporary music in general. It's something that I think you can't have from classical music. Mm. There's a certain point, you can always play something better, but there's a certain point when the technical challenge of the piece stops and you, it's what it is. And I think with with complex contemporary music, it, it's you're never there. It's like always trying to attain something where it's just slightly beyond where you can get to. How do you, how do you feel that the um, sixth quartet relates to Brian's earlier quartets? Most of the time in the sixth quartet, um, the it it feels like it feels like a very free piece. One is playing in the spaces and things happen, but it's kind of a dialogue. Things are not happening quite so rigidly as in some of the other quartets. And then there are sections where there is synchronicity, even something he introduced in Exordium, which is the Elliot Carter 100th birthday piece, um, unison playing, not only unison rhythm, but unison pitches, which is something sort of unheard of, uh, unheard of in general, but unheard of in Brian's music. And so... In fu funny sort of way, the the playing together becomes more difficult because when one is used to the language of Brian's melodic writing, it is very melodic, the piece. I think it's possibly more melodic than any of the other quartets. Um, and the pitch, pitch structure also seems to be very coherent. This is something very interesting that Brian discussed in rehearsing the piece the concept of the, of the pitches and it's very hard that that comes out and it's very difficult to to understand that without an explanation that's why it's so incredibly important i think it's incredibly important to rehearse with any composer to find out exactly what they want because something i've always said in the past that they they make a score and it's on paper and you know there's nothing there's no sound and we have to realize it and so to have the composer there to to witness, to explain, to change, whatever, transform the dots on the paper into sound is very important for me as an interpreter to get that feedback. But in Brian's music, it's it's particularly important because he is a composer that knows precisely what he writes. And it's so complex that to have him there analyzing what you're doing and telling you, I want to hear a bit more of this or that, um, is something that is so important and certainly in regard to pitches because there are so many notes and it's a question to prioritize and understand he understands what he wants to come through and maybe it's written in the dynamics but it's not one always it's not always perceivable as an interpreter it it's really marvelous to have him there from the very beginning so that a performance is is, is put down that it, that is something you can work from. The highest level of accuracy is important from the beginning of the workings of every piece because then you go from this high level. If you start down here, you have too far to go. But if you start very near the top, achieving, um, as we always have to do, achieving um, a very high level of accuracy from the very first performance, it's very important um, to have as much possibility to to be so many rungs up the ladder to start with. Do you, therefore, as a, as a quartet, practice and prepare your own individual parts as if they were a solo? Yeah, I think we don't spend so much time preparing because it's important to relate in 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 the rehearsal to what, what is going on. We prepare enough to know what we're supposed to do. But I think contemporary music, most pieces are like playing solo pieces.
the individual parts are very challenging. There's no second violin or viola inner parts in most contemporary music. You have that in about 10% of our repertoire. But mostly um, all the parts are, are challenging and one has to be able to play them on one's own. Um, absolutely. And you mentioned about the harmonic and especially these, these pictures that you were aiming towards. Did that change? How did that realise itself in the pro rehearsal process? I think when Brian illustrated what he wanted, we had to try and realise that. And it wasn't always so easy to, to make these chords sound. He was talking about soggy mala at the end. It's obviously, um, obviously triads and things displaced by quarter tones very often, or microtones, eight tones, I think. Um, but to, to, to make this clear is something that's very difficult. And Brian's music is very much about harmony and the melodic lines and microtonal inflections. In so many of the pieces, one has to really look very carefully at what the notes are, because he's playing around with certain key pitches and one note is a microtone above, then you have the normal note, a microtone below, the semitone below, and then microtones around that. And these inflections, I think, are really important in the interpretation of his music, to do them accurately. And did you come across those right at the, when you first read the score, or was this something when you, you became aware of when you started rehearsing? No, it's something, those are the things you look at before to see, but then sometimes you don't see them because they're rather small. Um, the, the accidentals with the quarter tone inflections. So that's why it's important to have Brian there to illustrate that. So when you analyse the score when you first see it, are you m looking at the, mostly at the structural areas of the piece, where its various sections are, as well as looking at actually how you're going to we're, coordinate? We're looking at that when we rehearse together with the, with the group. Um, when we rehearse individually, when we just look at the part, it's just a question to sort out what the notes are and perhaps not even, I don't even rhythmize it, rhythmatize it. Am I inventing words like Brian does? I'm not sure, but it, it's okay for this film if I am. Um, but to rhythmatize um, something I don't often do until the process of how the piece is going to be played is done. Often I'm just looking at the pitches and seeing how to play them from one note to the next and um, Dynamics, I think dynamics are something very important to get right in the beginning because once you condition yourself not to do something um, it's very hard to then put the process back into doing it. Often I've heard students saying I'm just doing this for the rhythm now or I'm going to play the right notes later or I'm just doing this for the pitches. Dynamics always seem to get left out and I think, you know, we, we have natural responses to things we're conditioned. If we do things when we're young, we learn them much quicker. If we do things when we're rehearsing right from the beginning, from the first time we start rehearsing a piece, then they stay inside. And then the concert is a realization of all the things that we've prepared. Whereas if we leave, if we do it in layers and leave some things till later, these are the things that suffer in performance and it takes much longer to then incorporate them. How much do you read what the composer has written about their music or read other people's analyses of the music when you're not actually preparing the works? I don't really read analysis of music. Um, I think it's not interesting. It's not interesting for me to read analysis of music. It's not interesting for me to listen to other performers when the situation occurs, rarely to listen to other interpretations of pieces. I like to to play music as I see it and as I hear it. And there's a certain sort of satisfaction in rehearsing like that without preconditions. We even tried that playing Janacek and Nielsen, not listening to other interpretations. And I, I kind of like that. We were invited to the Janacek Festival in Bruno about 10 years ago to play both of the quartets and we played them and I think we played them okay and but not probably like Jana Czech specialists Czech string quartets and so the promoter came to me after the concert and I quite cheekily said to him after he'd 
offered his congratulations for the performances. I said, why, can I ask you a question? Why did you ask us? It was a particular anniversary of Janacek's death, I think. Why did you ask us to play this concert when, when you have so many classical groups that, that play this music? Um, they, you know, the, of tradition, why do you ask the Arditi Quartet? And he said, because we really love the way you play Janacek, because you don't play it like anybody else. You play it the way Janacek, the, you play it the way we think Janacek would have wanted to hear it. For me, that was, um, that was a wonderful statement. I was very happy that we'd actually achieved something with my concept of, of working things out for ourselves and perhaps this going back to something um, and not being conditioned by what we hear from other people. Are you conditioned by what the composers say when they go when they give lectures on works? No, I go. To, I I like the relationship between rehearsals, where composers are telling us what they want. Mm. Yes, I think it's fine to go to lectures, but after the first performance, right. there's always time to go back. I think when you prepare a piece, I don't want the music to be talked about by somebody else. Only the composer. Absolutely, and there's there's often no possibility for that anyway because the music is still wet when we're starting it and the ink is still wet, shall we say, and uh, so nobody's analysed it. Sometimes it's it's really hard to get a programme note if the composer doesn't want to write one because the music is too fresh. People haven't got time to write it. And how do you feel that the Sixth Quartet has now developed as you've gone through, what well, you must have done five, six performances so far? Yes, I feel with the Sixth Quartet, it, it develops like most pieces do. The more you play them, um, the more you see into them. And we had the tremendous possibility of three repeats in Donna Eschingen on the one day. So this, it to some way, solidified it. But then when we went back for the next performance, the fourth, for the Huddersfield Festival, we then, things didn't come so easy after a month or five weeks of not playing the piece. We then had to go back and, and really rehearse it very vigorously and then I think some things changed obviously you you then are dealing with the memory of the way you did it and and the reality of the way you're going to to, to deal with it so the two things mix together and you have a third you know a second thing and then so on the next performance it goes on like this I think pieces develop and because I see the piece being very much a melodic piece in many ways um, one one can go on with this thought and make it more melodic, bring phrases together more. I think that one of the difficult things is to understand the phrases in this sort of music uh, and to know how to perform them. And so this is something that definitely improves the more you have a possibility of being into a piece, the more you play it and the more you rehearse it. Changes within the day, within the first day, are quite difficult but you, because you're conditioned to do something and then as the two performances follow on, the two following performances in the same day, you're then trying to repeat um, exactly what you did with greater accuracy. I think it's the time in between um, which helps because you forget things. And when you forget things, you then have to refresh yourself. And when you refresh yourself, as I said, you have the memory of what you've done. So maybe there's a, there's a chance to take it to a next level and change it slightly and make something else because you have the support of the memory. The support is knowing what you've done and the reality is what you're going to do because no two days are ever the same in life. Can you say something a bit more about phrasing? Because I think that's one of those things about Brian's music which tends to be overlooked if people are concentrating on the minute detail about it rather than the actual overall shaping. I think sometimes uh, phrasing and realising what is a phrase in Brian's music is not so easy to understand. This is another reason why he's so important to be there and to communicate things. Um, what often looks like a series of isolated notes often becomes a phrase, um, not, not only just with your part, but often within the group, within the quartet. And so to understand where it's going, to understand the importances, to understand the Hauptstimme, the main lines, um, I don't mean solos, but just main lines in certain sections. Um, I think that's something that doesn't come immediately. 
because in the beginning you're just trying to play the note in the right place and to understand exactly where it comes and that quite honestly is not so easy with the complicated way Ryan writes music it, it is very difficult to achieve that so one's attention is primarily taken up with that but with the relaxation of, of the knowledge of how to do it enough rehearsal or previous performances I think it's possible to take things one step further and then um, one can more clearly articulate the, the the phrases within music if if there are if they are to be articulated. Ryan talks about layers. He talks about colenio, um, main lines without colenio. So he has a kind of woody sound for the interior, the accompaniments, or not even accompaniments, but subsidiary voices, shall we say? I don't think there are ever any accompaniments in this music. Just. Um, main voices and, and subsidiary voices um, and to understand all this is something that needs an awful lot of time and there we go back to the constant challenge of this music why it's so interesting to play and why one never gets bored with it Ryan talks about his music technically he tends to talk about it very much from a sort of bar by bar level the bar is very important to him uh, but also he tends to be microscopic in that way. He tends to think of one unit, which he then subdivides and then subdivides again and subdivides again. Do you then find that you're going back into a physicality from the notation? Yes, I think Brian often talks about the bar line and the importance within the bar. And I think the irrationals always remain in the bar. Often they're more concentrated within a bar. Um, I think one has to talk microscopically initially when you're when you're interpreting Brian's music because that's what the accuracy is about the accuracy is about microscopically thinking and then the opposite of microscope is macroscope macroscopically one one when one has the relaxation of um of of being familiar with what's going on in the bar you you think past that and you join phrases together and sections sections are very important to know one has to do things from one point to the next and that's not falling within a bar it can fall within many bars um, so I think that's the secondary process the phrasing process the concept of that but also the analysis of the work that's where the analysis comes in to understand how that evolves how the larger picture evolves